me also welcome all of you to the United Nations and good afternoon to everyone. I'm honored to be with you and the opportunity to speak and share some ideas on financing for sustainable development. There are three parts to my presentation. First is a very personal story I want to share with you. And I must also tell you, Pierre, the selection of this room and this floor connects very well with the UN's work on financing. This is uh, the decade of 90s. Financial capitalism be is becoming the norm. That was the mantra that was coming from all corners of the world. And very heady days at the United Nations because the Cold War had ended. And it looked very promising at that time. It still is, but it was very promising in the 90s. So in 1997, the Asian crisis hits. The Russian crisis, peso crisis, one after the other. It was in this basement. I was relatively young at that time, representing a government. 1997 financial crisis brought to the fore very visibly the systemic flaws we were confronted with. Fortunately, there was no contagion, but we saw very graphic images of empty rice bowls in Indonesia, people in the streets in Thailand and Philippines, Economies shaken to the core because they had liberalized their capital accounts. And here in this basement, United Nations came together and asked for a conference on financing for development, which will address the systemic challenges. Of course, national international actions also. And it took five years, from 97 to 2002, and the UN adopted a document, historic document called the Monterey Consensus. And I assume, and I'm sure rightly, that most of you are very familiar with the Washington Consensus. Washington Consensus was a consensus around 10 actions that if you took as a government, you would succeed in getting on the trajectory to higher growth and you will achieve <coughs> development. The UN's answer to those principles was the Monterey Consensus because the Washington Consensus was failing many countries. The UN was saying, even if you go for structural adjustment, whatever shifts you want to bring at the national level, human beings should be at the center. Structural adjustment with the human phase was the UN's mantra. You cannot ignore human sufferings when you are taking financial decisions. And that was the crux of the Monterey Consensus. But it called for major systemic changes, institutional and policy changes. Just 2000, two years before the Monterey Consensus was adopted, UN also adopted the Millennium Development Goals, bare minimum that we needed to achieve to fight poverty. And the president mentioned this morning his poverty profitable poverty eradication. It is a business. Poverty, bare minimum health, maternal mortality, very minimal goals that we adopted. The message was, the system is working, but not for everyone. And if you look at the last 50 years, wealth has quadrupled, even more than that. Population has doubled. Poverty has been 
alleviated in many countries. Yet, you hear very loud noises. If I were to borrow, it's not UN's characterization, but it's a characterization of the decade of deception, decade of discontentment, decade of disillusionment. Deception is not in a negative way. It primarily conveys that you were told that the rising tide will lift all boats. Deception, it didn't happen. It happened for a few. Disillusionment led to another financial crisis in 2008. Discontentment, and now we see disillusionment, which is leading to populism. So that's where we are. The Monterey Consensus, the MDGs, the mantra that all boats will rise. It worked, but not for everyone. So that's my personal story. Monterey Consensus actively worked on it. We had great hopes, partially implemented, but it left many people behind. That brings me to the second part of my presentation to you. What did we witness after 2009? Everyone was saying it's the financial system which is ruining us, nothing else. There are protests on the Wall Street. 400 cities in 80 countries, people were on the roads. They were not happy. Discontentment was very palpable. UN again came to the forefront with two historic agreements. One is the Sustainable Development Goals, which cover everything that should be covered on this planet if we want to prosper as humanity. And the Addis Ababa Action Agenda, which was how do you finance these goals. And that brings me to the second part about what we did last April. Four messages that I want to share, and then I have two challenges for you. You are financial experts that we need your help in advancing that agenda. So the Addis Ababa Action Agenda has seven chapters. So we published a report. This is published by 60 organizations, which includes the World Bank, the IMF, and we have copies available for you. The message from the cover page is, if you do not fix the roots, which is financing, the trees of SDGs will not flourish or bear fruits. Financing is at the root of this agenda. We need to fix all those seven flows of financing, which includes domestic resource mobilization, investment, which we'll address in a little while, debt, trade, technology, and development cooperation. All these seven have to align if we want to save the future of humanity and this planet. What we said in this report and the outcome document from the Financing for Development Forum conveys clearly, unambiguously, given the geoeconomics and geopolitics of this juncture, if we do few things right, we can shift our trajectory. First and foremost, our faith in multilateralism, collective action, should be reinforced. Second, systemic changes are needed. We need to fix them, fix them now. Trading system has to work multilaterally. It has to be reinforced. We have to find a solution, a durable one, to sovereign debt, because 30 countries are already in debt distress. It happens after every decade. Something is wrong. Something is rotten in the state of Denmark. <laughs> we have to fix it. And then technological disruption, youth and employment, 
and ecological distress. Today, our colleagues from the Convention on Biodiversity have released a report in Paris, which is alarming. It says the damage we have done to our biodiversity has, was not done in the last 10 million years. One million species will disappear. It's not you have to preserve the species. They will disappear, disrupting your food supply, your existence on this planet. And I always say we keep on giving awards every year and emissions keep on going up. Carbon emissions have not gone down. What are we doing with climate change? So the message is if we do not address these challenges by shifting our attitudes on financing, if we miss this juncture, we may be missing a big opportunity, historic opportunity. Now let me come to the third part, which is how do you inject investment towards the sustainable development goals? And I like the 17 whys that you said this morning. Let's turn those whys into hows. <laughs> And let's never treat each goal separately. You can't, you can't have prosperous planet with every one included if you do them individually. They exist in totality. We ran a search recently because we were working for the investment fair for the SDGs. When you put in a phrase called SDG investment gap, you get over 1,000 results. When you say SDG investment opportunity, seven results. So we are falling way short in presenting SDGs as an, as an investment opportunity. We need your help in framing SDGs, not as charity, not as SDG investment gap. It's an opportunity for every wealth manager, wealth owner. But that requires a shift in the mindset, in the way you perceive and pursue profits, and also the incentives and regulatory part. Investments do not flow in a vacuum. We have many figures, four to five trillion dollars, five to seven trillion dollars, 2.5 trillion dollars in Asia. All these figures are valid. And you always wonder in a world where nine trillion dollars are earning negative interest rate, why aren't these trillions flowing towards SDGs? It doesn't make sense. So the UN Secretary General is launching, he has already announced, is launching a Global Investors for Sustainable Development Alliance. 30 CEOs from all over the world, including pension fund managers, big financial advisors. He's bringing them together on 26th of September here in New York with three challenges. But we have to generate ideas. We need your help. First and foremost, what can you do within your own sector, within your own firm, to shift investments truly behind the 2030 agenda? It does not mean green washing and blue washing. It's a genuine shift. Investment opportunity with profits, yet you are saving the planet and including everyone into prosperity. First is a call to them, what do you want? What do you offer? Second, that's individually. What can you do collectively? Let's not forget they, they compete with each other. They have competitive pressures. As an industry, they have to come together to give those ideas. Third, what can the public sector do? What incentives and regulations should change to shift investments on the trajectory to sustainable development? You work on harmonizing rules 
and regulations all over the world. There are governments, by the way, and one government was here to present that there is a network, national network, that government has changed the concept of fiduciary responsibility to direct investment towards the 2030 agenda. We need your energy, your independence behind the 2030 agenda and behind the Secretary General's initiative. So I challenge you to send us your ideas that the Secretary General can use in his conversation with these CEOs. I also challenge you to send your initiatives, which we can announce in September, that you are taking as independent financial advisors to modify your client's perspective and investment behaviors. We really need your support in advancing this agenda. Financing for development will only happen if every manager, every wealth owner changes their decisions to deploy their money behind these goals. And we appeal to you to join us in this work. Thank you, Jean-Pierre, for this opportunity.